Let's turn our Bibles this morning to Daniel chapter 12. This will be our last uh, sermon on Daniel in our series. Begin reading at verse 4 and going through the rest of the chapter, Daniel chapter 12. Starting at verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on the bank of the river and the other on that, the other on that, on the bank of the river. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be until the end of these wonders? I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left towards heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard but could not understand, so I said, My Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Heavenly Father, as we come to this closing passage and as we consider all that really has been said in this book and what is said here this morning. I pray that you'd help me to be clear in my proclamation of it, help us to be focused in our listening of it, help us to be diligent in our application of it. We just ask your blessing upon your word this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday and today in Roswell, Georgia, there's an event taking place called the Big Psychic Fair. The advertisement states that the event is an icon in the metaphysical community, and many great psychics started here. Now, the reason why I know about this is because it came up on my Facebook feed that someone that I'm friends with in Facebook is interested in this event. You know, there's events and you can say you're interested, et cetera, et cetera. That wasn't anybody in this room. We're in our church. And immediately as I saw that, I asked myself, why? Why do people flock to charlatans when God's word provides the truth about all things past, present, and future? So today we're going to finish up our study of Daniel, this incredible prophecy which God gave Daniel about the future of the Gentile Gentile kingdoms, which of course have already happened, already come to pass, and also the yet future of what God has in store for the world and Israel, and how it all leads to the glorious kingdom of Christ. And as we look at the final words that are given in this book, you need to, you need to consider this all-important question. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with Daniel? That's the title of the message. Is the study of prophecy just something that fascinates the imagination, or will, it, will you apply it in a way that stimulates your spiritual growth and your sanctification? Peter said it well, following his description of the destruction of the world and, uh, to make way for the new heaven and new earth, which will follow the thousand-year reign, when he challenges his readers with this question in 2 Peter chapter 3. Verses 10 11. He writes, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness? What sort of people are you going to be? So the challenge for us as we bring this study to close is the same. What are we going to do with Daniel? What are we going to do with these truths? So as we look at this passage, the sermon in a sentence this morning is that God has given you an incredible look into the future. What are you going to do with it? God has given you an incredible look into the future. 
What are you going to do with it? Well, let's consider this challenge as we first notice the sealing of the book. Verse 4 and verse 9, Daniel is told to seal up the book. Verse 4 says, As for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. So Daniel's told to do something very specific. He's told to seal it up. Now, as we seek to understand exactly what that is meant, what was meant by that, I think it's important that we don't see this as some kind of a time capsule instruction. You ever do time capsules, maybe in school or, I don't know, maybe just very creative imagine, uh, you know, imagination by parents? You bury something and you put it in a time capsule and you're supposed to dig it back up in 10 years or whatever. I wonder how many of those get forgotten about and never get dug up. Daniel's not being told to do that. He's not being told to hide his writing so that nobody can read it and nobody knows about it. Some suggest the idea of this phrase is to protect it, recognizing its importance as inspired scripture, that it needs to be available to people for a long time period of time. That certainly fits the idea of sealing a book. In Old Testament times, important documents were protected. They were sealed so that you couldn't open them if you weren't the proper, didn't have the authority to do so. It would be obvious if someone tampered with the document to change it because the seal would be broken. Certainly, I believe that's part of the idea here, but I want you to notice the emphasis to the end of time. Seal up the book until the end of time. And I want you to notice that we see the exact opposite instruction given to the Apostle John regarding the book of Revelation. Now keep in mind, Daniel is the Old Testament version of the book of Revelation. We've seen this throughout our study, haven't we? That Daniel will say something and then we'll go to Revelation and see it even described in more detail. When you get to the book of Revelation, you see the exact opposite instruction given to John. Notice Revelation 1.3 and Revelation 22.10. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Chapter 22, verse 10, and he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. So twice we see this emphasis that the time is near. Because the time is near John, near, John is told not to seal up the words of the prophecy of the book. Now if you go back to Daniel 8.26, and we're not going to throw it up on the screen or anything, but if you go back to Daniel 8.26, we are told there that Daniel was prophesying of things that pertain to many days of the future. So we have the exact opposite idea. Daniel's prophesying about stuff that's many days in the future, and he's told to seal it up. John is told to not seal up his prophecy because the time is near. John is writing some 600 years after Daniel. John is writing, and this is more important than the years, John is writing after the incarnation, after the earthly ministry of Christ, after his resurrection and his ascension. So John is writing now in what we call the beginning of the, the church age which is often referred to as the last days. So from a prophetic standpoint, when John is writing the time of these events is near, there's nothing else that has to happen in the prophetic calendar, but from the, from the time frame of Daniel, from the, from the same idea of prophetic calendar or prophetic things, the time is far off. We still have to have the coming of the Messiah. We still have to have uh, the church age, etc. So I think this really gives the main idea because both books are teaching the same thing. It's not like they're teaching different messages. They're teaching about the same thing. They're teaching about the tribulation period as you get into these last chapters of Daniel and, uh, of course, the entire book of Revelation. So I think the main idea of this command to seal up the book is that the actual events that are spoken of are far off and they don't need to be fully understood yet. Daniel keeps wanting to understand. He keeps giving these comments about verse 8, for example, he could not understand. My Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? And he's just told, Daniel, don't worry about it. Seal it up. This is, this is to the end time. 
Whereas for John, he says just the opposite. So what does this mean for you? Well, if the time was near for John, it certainly is near for us. Much closer for us, at least 2,000 years closer for us. So unlike Daniel, we're not to seal up the book, but we're rather to read it and understand it and proclaim it. In fact, that is just what Daniel 12, 4 says will take place as you get closer to the end times. Look again at the end of verse 4. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. So it's obvious this book wasn't meant to be hidden. Matter of fact, Jesus references it in Matthew 24. Right? He, met, he references the abomination of desecration, the very things that Daniel has been teaching about in these last couple chapters. So obviously the Jews were very familiar with Daniel. It wasn't put in a time capsule. It wasn't being hidden. And so we must ask ourselves this or consider this. As your knowledge has increased, so is your responsibility to apply it. What are you going to do with Daniel? We're not to get caught up with the when of these events, as so many people do, but we need to recognize the certainty of these events and that we're getting closer to them. So people need to be told. People need to be saved. People, you and I need to be living lives committed to holiness in the fear of the Lord. God has given you an incredible look into the future. What are you going to do with it? Now notice the subject of the book, verse 7 through 11. There are certain things in this passage that we've referenced last week, and I'm not going to go into quite as many details about this morning, but these verses provide somewhat of a summary, a very succinct summary, of the end times, especially where Israel is concerned. It's largely motivated by the questions that are asked by the unnamed individuals, no doubt angels, who are standing on the side of the river. And the question involves, how long will this time last? Verse 7, I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. As he raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. We've seen that expression throughout Daniel. We see it in the book of Revelation. And we understand those, those uh, phrases to equal three and a half years. A time, one year, times, or two years, and a half a time, a half a year. And so this isn't about when is it going to happen from the standpoint of how many years before Christ comes or anything like that. This is how long does this time last that has been the focus of this description. Of course, we've talked last week, and we again see in this passage an emphasis of the terrible persecutions and afflictions that await God's people during this time and the whole world. So certainly one would wonder how long. No doubt, like us, they're anxious for the end of all this. They're anxious for the end of sin. They're anxious for the end of uh, the curse of sin. They're anxious for the, the kingdom to come. Even angels, they're anxious for it. They don't like sin any more than we do, even though they don't have to personally, they don't personally experience it. But as the one answered the question of the other, not only did the question of how long get answered, but with it a description of what would take place at that time. And so the first thing we see is we look at basically the subject of this book as it's summarized here in Daniel chapter 12, is that the great tribulation would be a time of shattering of God's people. Look at the end of verse 7. As soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. Not exactly what Daniel would want to hear. Not exactly what any Jew would want to hear. Three and a half years described by that prophetic formula of a time, times, and half a time would be three and a half years of fierce persecution that would shatter the power of the holy people. Kind of reminds me of a time when my brother decided to test my mom's, I think, are they Cornell or Corel? I can't remember. Corel. You know, they were touted as being unbreakable. Well, being a teenager, 
my brother decided to test that theory. So we had, you know, this is an old New England house. This, I suppose it wouldn't matter if it was New England, but, you know, our sinks were like, you know, these big cast iron type, I don't know if they were cast iron, but they were big, hardy sinks. And so my brother got back to about, well, we had a little pantry. So he was in the kitchen, I know that. He had to fling through the, halfway through the kitchen, probably into the pantry, probably a good 15, 20 feet, into the sink. And, you know, technically, maybe you could say they didn't break. They shattered. I didn't know plates could shatter into that many pieces. And, of course, you, you know, he, what we did after that, we diligently went to our parents and uh, explained all that. No, I, I, there's just one less dish in the house. But Israel was to be shattered. As we saw in last week's message in verse 1, a time of distress such as never occurred. Same idea Jesus mentions in Matthew 24. So this will be a horrific time of judgment. If you go to the book of Revelation, as we probably know, three sets of judgments, three sets of seven judgments, I should say, described by the symbols of the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Matter of fact, they decimate the entire earth and bring about the death of over half of the Earth's population at that time. Now, if you want to know what that means, um, the Earth's population now is approximately 9 billion people. Maybe we're up to 10, I'm not sure, but 9 billion people. So uh, let's just say that during this time, there's, you know, let's make it even 10 billion people on the Earth. That means 5 billion would be killed. Then you add to that the fact that Israel would be the country with the bullseye on its back, the one that the Antichrist would specifically go after in the second half of the tribulation as he breaks his treaty of peace and seeks to destroy God's covenant people. Why would God allow that? Now, the tribulation has several purposes. One reason for the tribulation, the one that we usually think of, is that the tribulation is a time of God's wrath upon the world to judge sin and to judge the evils of all that are in the world and unbelief and everything else. And certainly that is a main purpose of the tribulation, but there's a second purpose for the tribulation. It's not destructive, it's redemptive. And it's specifically redemptive for Israel. So this shattering of the people of God is part of the process that leads many to humble themselves and finally turn to their Messiah for salvation. One author writes, the Lord's intention is not to destroy his people, but to bring them to the point of brokenness so they will look to their Messiah whom they have feared. And that's exactly what will happen. Notice it's not just a time of shattering, but it's a time of sanctifying. Notice verse 10. Many will be purged, purified, and refined. But the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. But those who have insight will understand. Many will be purged, purified, and refined. You see, the time of tribulation is a time where God fulfills his covenant with Israel. The time in which they turn to him as a nation. As Paul wrote in Romans chapter 11, in Romans chapter 11, verse 1, which isn't up on the PowerPoint, but I just want to share the question of verse 1, that verse is 25 and 27 is part of the answer to, kind of the conclusion of the answer to. Paul started off this chapter by saying, well, has God rejected his people? What Paul does, especially in the book of Romans, is he writes like a lawyer, and he's basically giving the objections that he was hearing, that people were giving to uh, God's plan of salvation and election and, and Gentiles, the gospel go to the Gentiles, and so the question he's answering in Romans chapter 11 is the one he brings up in verse 1 where he writes, "Is God rejected his people. And then he course, says, God forbid. As he goes through the explanation, we get to verse 25 through 27, we read this. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sin. 
That fullness of the Gentiles, I believe, is uh, what precipitates the rapture. Fullness of the Gentiles comes in, the church is raptured out, and God turns his attention to Israel for redemption during the tribulation period, which we read in in Revelation 7, 144,000 Jews are saved, 12,000 from every tribe. They become one of the main evangelistic forces during the tribulation period. Notice what Zechariah says in Zechariah 13, 1, and then in verses 8 and 9 of that same chapter. On that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. In verse 8 and 9, And the whole land declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. (coughs) And I'll put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold is tested. They'll call upon my name, and I will answer them. And I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Zechariah not only uses the same or similar language of Daniel of the, of the salvation, that it's a refining, it's a purging. He actually even gives us a number, or a, a fraction, I should say, an amount, that a third of Israel would be redeemed and saved during this time. So God is faithful. God is faithful to his people. God is faithful to the covenant. Think about this again. Daniel's the one hearing this. Daniel is, is the one communicating this. So this would mean, you know, something to him that we can't fully grasp, at least the emotional depth of it. Because certainly where they were at in their time of history at that time, and then hearing about the shattering of God's people would make them wonder, has God rejected his people? Daniel's being told no. They will be redeemed. They will be refined. They will be purged. They will be purified. As I kind of started to humorously say when my brother shattered that dish, all we could do was sweep up the pieces and throw them away. And of course, we could have gone and confessed, but I don't think we did that. Only God can take what is shattered and make it whole. We could have never, I mean, this wasn't, you know, a plate broken three pieces. Some of you, I could tell by your head bobbing, you've had this happen to you. They literally shattered in hundreds of pieces. Would have been humorous if we tried to put that together. But you know, God can do that. God can take the shattered people of Israel. He can take the shattered lives of people today and he can restore them and heal them and, and purge them of their sin and cleanse them. And that's what he desires to do. If you've never been saved, if you're hearing this message, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, then your life is probably a mess. In many ways, if not in the same way or level of someone else, but it is in your soul. God can put you together. He can make you whole. Christian, we are constantly needing to be purified and refined, sanctified, growing in our faith. Are we allowing God to do that on the level that he wishes to do that? Of course, not all are going to turn to the Lord. Zechariah tells Daniel that two-thirds of Israel will not. And we see that kind of emphasis in a more general way here in the passage of verse 10. But the wicked will act wickedly. In other words, those that don't believe, those that turn to God are just going to keep doing their wickedness. They're going to keep living in unbelief. They're going to keep living in sin. Despite all of the obvious displays of God's wrath in the tribulation period, despite the miraculous testimony of the two witnesses during the tribulation period, even angels who are sent in Revelation 14 to go throughout the earth preaching the everlasting gospel. Many will stay hardened to the truth. We see a very similar expression, shouldn't surprise us by now, in the book of Revelation. Revelation, the very last chapter of Revelation, says this in verses 10 and 11. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. Now John is not encouraging wicked people to live wickedly. He's just saying the wicked are going to keep doing what they do. If you haven't turned to God, if you haven't turned to Christ, if you haven't been saved, 
You're going to keep on doing this. And the righteous are going to do what's right and what is holy. So God has given us this incredible look at the future and what, where do we fit into that equation? Are we going to live righteously and holy in light of the second coming of Christ, in light of the time where we will one day stand before God? Or are some going to continue to live wickedly, continue to live in unbelief? You know, the reality of the coming of the end times and the face-to-face -face judgment of God will either spur you to righteousness or increase your apathy, your hardness of heart. Which is it going to be for you? Now, at this point, we see some rather odd numbers regarding the length of this period. Three and a half years, based on the Jewish calendar, equals 1,260 days. And we see that number in other places in Scripture. Sometimes we see it listed in months, 42 months. The Jewish calendar was 30 days each, not 31 one month and 30 the next month. So it comes out to 1,260 days. If you want to later look at that, you can see those numbers in Revelation 11, verse 2 and 3, and Revelation 12, 6. So the question is, why do we now have a reference of 1,290 days and then a blessing if you wait or if you endure until the 1,335 days? Now, there's nowhere in Scripture that fully details this or explains it. In fact, it's mentioned here, and I don't know that it's really mentioned anywhere else. But as we look at what is mentioned, as we look at what is going to happen Conservative scholars would point, first of all, to the fact that at the final battle of Armageddon, this massive battle of all, you know, the major world uh, empires coming together and, and then uh, fighting each other, well, and then, of course, Christ uh, judging them and, and destroying them. You go from that to the Millennial Kingdom. Okay, the new earth and new heaven isn't until after the thousand-year reign. So there's a lot of cleanup that's got to take place. There's a lot of burial that's got to take place. There's a lot of practical stuff that has to happen until you can really enjoy the kingdom. And so most see that, th these numbers, as indicating this transition time between the end of the uh, tribulation period in the beginning of the thousand year reign. And then add to that, Matthew talks about the judgment that will take place that will um, separate the sheep from the goats, the believers from the unbelievers, in order for them to enter into the kingdom of God. We read about that in Matthew 25. So, uh, you know, God doesn't necessarily do these things in just a blink of an eye like magic, you know, this would take time. So Matthew 25, verse 31 through 34, describes that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he'll separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he'll place the sheep on his right with the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So, you know, you have the armies of the earth and Armageddon being destroyed and killed, but not everybody on the earth. And so here we see a description of the gathering of people from all the corners, as the scripture will use that expression, of the earth and judgment happening so that only those who enter into the kingdom of God are redeemed people. So it makes sense between the, the cleanup factor and the judgment of the sheep and the goats that you have this this time frame, and that kind of fits into the blessing part. If you're still on the earth after 1,335 days, you're not a goat. You've gone into the kingdom. I don't know if you remember this message. I'll have to, I'll have to bring it back one day. You know, I told my wife, I kind of half jokingly told my wife that one day I'll do a series of um, my greatest hits. You know? Uh, bring out my favorite sermons and preach them for a series or whatever. And I, I don't know if this was one of my greatest sermons, but it might have been one of my best titles. You remember the sermon I preached, It's Not Good to Be a Goat? It was on this passage, Matthew 25. It's not good to be a goat. 
So will you be a part of that blessedness? Will you be a sheep? Which leads us to the last point, and that's the sure blessedness Daniel can be assured of. Daniel's one of these blessed ones. What a wonderful verse of scripture. Imagine Daniel hearing this, but as for you, you know, we just saw all this about Israel and the, uh, the shattering of God's people, and some will act wickedly still, and some will be purged and refined. But as for you, Daniel, go your way to the end, and then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. What a great way to end this message to Daniel. A personal assurance that Daniel's future involves a resurrection under the kingdom long promised to his people that he would inherit his portion, that none of the wicked rulers, none of the kingdoms, or the final man of sin will keep Daniel and all who have been redeemed from experiencing the blessings that await. You know, we sometimes might forget this. Daniel never has been able to enjoy hardly, you know, maybe except for the first 10 or 12 years of his life, living in Israel. Daniel, you're going to get your portion. You're going to enjoy the promised land. You will enter into rest. In other words, you're going to die. A long time is going to take place, but then you're going to rise again. So until that time, keep being faithful. I think that's the point of go your way to the end. Keep being faithful. Don't give up. We see this exhortation in various forms in, in, a, in a similar context, like Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. He said, therefore, a nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. And calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. Do what God's called you to do. Go your way to the end. Be faithful. Because one day you will receive your portion. You and I will also, with Daniel, rise again to the grave. We will inherit that which God has prepared for us. We will enjoy this glorious kingdom with him. What are we going to do with that truth? Will we be faithful to our end, knowing that it's really not our end, but it'll just be the beginning of our glorious eternity with Christ? Heavenly Father, I pray that you will take your word this morning and use it for those of us that are saved, that we will continue to be faithful, that we will strive to grow as much as we can in our faith. And Lord, for those that might hear this message that don't know Christ, may they recognize they don't have to stay in their sin. They don't have to continue living in rebellion and rejection of God's word, living a life of sin, but they can be saved and cleansed and refined and purged. I pray that you do that wonderful work in their lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.